sadly, a lot of our pol um, policy makers and commentators uh, who really kind of should understand this stuff better have a, a, a kind of a naive or simplistic understanding of how big these big gas mega projects um, impact the rest of the economy. So the way it's presented is that we have the existing, the existing economy with you know, a certain amount of jobs and econo economic activity and then a big gas project comes along that employs a certain amount of people and also has a certain amount of economic activity. And the kind of naive view of it is that you just, that just sits on top of the existing economy, so you get all those additional jobs and economic activity, right? It's like icing on the cake. But that's actually not how it works. It's much more complicated than that. And the reason is that big projects like this crowd out um, jobs and economic activity in other industries. And the reason for that is that when uh, ordinarily when some industries, because industries in the economy are always expanding and contracting over time, right? But normally, with, with pretty much any other industry I can think of, it's a gradual process. It builds up gradually, um, there's time for, to build up the workforce, to get the skills happening, to provide housing for people, the services that these businesses are going to need. So it, it builds up kind of organically. In the case of the gas industry, uh, they, what they need to do is ramp up an enormous workforce of several thousand people at least uh, very, very quickly and that have an, extent, a, a, an intensive construction period uh, over a few years and then it ramps right down and very few people are, are employed during the operational phase which, it, which is, would start about five years later. Right? So, so it's a very disruptive thing to happen to the economy. So... Um, so to think through the way this impacts the economy, uh, what, uh, what, uh, you, you can imagine that um, if you need thousands of skilled workers, the gas, industry, the gas industry doesn't look for people who are unemployed and need a job and then train them up to work in the gas industry, right? That's not a thing. They're not into training in particular. What they want is lots of skilled workers very quickly. So most of them are fly and fly out workers. The ones that are employed in, in the local community are not people sitting around waiting to find a job. They're people who already have jobs in, in other industries, right? Manufacturing, agriculture, uh, all, sorts of, all sorts of industries. So the gas industry attracts them by, by paying very high wages. Those people, th those businesses that have been employing those skilled people to date have probably spent, or often spent, years training them up. And when they, when they leave to work on the gas fields during this short-lived construction phase, the industries that were employing the skilled labour uh, need to compete with multinational gas companies on wages uh, to attract and retain labour, right? So their wage costs go right up the disruption goes, um, goes right up. And it's not just the labour costs, it's also, um, it's, it's the cost of everything. Because, the, because when these big industries come to town, they need vehicle service, they need machinery service, they need all sorts of services. And because it all happens really suddenly, that's not there. So anybody else trying to get their vehicle service, get their machinery service, um, you know, get all the kind of things they need to run their business, has to wait and has to pay more. And it pushes up inflation right through the economy. And another thing to remember is that it also, and, and this has all been experienced with, the, with IMPACT's ICTHIS project. I, I wasn't around then, but I'm sure a lot of people remember it. It drives up inflation and rents in particular. So if you're, a, if you're one of the 99.5% of Territorians who are not working in the gas industry, who are teachers, um, health workers, uh, working in uh, public administration, that kind of thing, the real job generators behind the economy, then you are going to, uh, you know, rent is going to be a lot more expensive and, um, and, a whole, and, and buying pretty much everything will be more expensive. So, and, and the net effect of that is that over time you crowd out jobs in other industries and um, you crowd out businesses. Businesses, some of those businesses will become unviable and close down. So you get more gas jobs and you get less of everything else. 
So you don't have to take my word for that um, because you just have to look at what the gas industry says. So Aero Energy, and apologies, you won't be able to read this from that distance, but I'll just explain it. Aero Energy was a very similar project in Queensland. It had huge gas fields and proposed a big LNG facility in, uh, in Gladstone. And they were very up, fr they, they were very up front about, um, about these crowding out impacts, albeit on a pa about page 900 of their environmental impact statement, right? But it was there for everybody to see uh, if you got through those 900 pages. But they have tables where they looked at the amount of jobs that would be added and lost in various industries. And this is just for the gas field component of their project. It's not for the LNG section. But, um, you know, for instance, there, there'd be... Um, so the neg I've highlighted the negative numbers. So there's uh, a lot of extra jobs in gas and construction, for instance. But there's huge job losses, like about 700 job, job losses in manufacturing, um, you know, there's job losses in, in agriculture and other sectors as well. So the gas industry itself acknowledges those crowding out effects. We can also look at Queensland because not, we don't just have to look at the modelling, we can look at what actually happened in Queensland. And one of the best studies on this is by the gas industry funded Sustainable Minerals Institute and they they did this report in 2014 during the peak of the construction phase and they surveyed stakeholders, so people who worked in mining, coal seam gas, the advocacy sector, the environment sector, the business community, the community sector, government and agriculture. So a whole range of stakeholders from the community. And they asked them what effect they thought CSG development, coal seam, onshore gas development and coal mining uh, had had on their communities. And they divided to figure out, to, 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 uh, to cl classify those areas, they divided it into types of capital. So natural capital is just the environment, financial capital is you know, the amount of um, finance and, uh, available, um, social capital is the social cohesion of the community, built capital is infrastructure, human capital is the workforce, skills, that kind of thing. So. People in the mining and CSG industry thought that um, CSG development and coal development had made pretty much everything better, although even they acknowledged that it had made infrastructure worse. Pretty much everyone else thought that CSG mining and, and coal mining had made everything worse, uh, with a few exceptions. And what I think is really amazing is that the business community, who always um, are very supportive of these big gas developments before they happen, you know, big advocates for allowing it to go forward, they thought it had made, when it actually happened, they thought it had made everything worse. All of those types of capital. And I think that's, that's really telling. Now, this is how the gas industry operates. They come to areas where there's gas under the ground and they target uh, some business owners and, and um, and, and you know, people I think have a bit of influence. They convince them that they're going to make a lot of money, and then those people go out and do the advocating for them, right? And they get on councils, and they do, they um, get chambers of commerce, and and um, and really push for it politically through the community. And some of them make money. There's no doubt about it. Some of them do a real estate deal or get contracts or something like that and make money, particularly in the short term. But a lot of them get burnt. I've been through towns through um, Queensland, Starling Downs, where all of this happened, and you speak to so many people who, the gas in, who tell you that the gas industry and the government came to town, told them that the roads would be paved with gold, suggested they invest in uh, doing up pubs, building accommodation, um, buying machinery, all of that kind of thing, and then the, the people stayed in workers' camps, so the accommodation was worth nothing, um, they, uh, they didn't get the contracts or the contracts only lasted for a few years and they overcapitalised, all of that kind of thing. So a lot of these people actually get burnt in the process. And a, a really, another really interesting study was done by the Gas Industry Social and Environmental Research Alliance, which is often presents itself as, it's called, uh, it's known by the acronym GISERA, and it often presents itself as the CSIRO, but it's not. It's a, an alliance of the five biggest gas companies operating in Queensland 
and a cash-strapped CSIRO. And uh, it, has, it has industry executives on, on all of its research committees. So it's very much a beast of the gas industry. And I mention that partly because it's actually been very influential in the Northern Territory. The Northern Territory Government is relying on Jazeera's advice a, a lot in sort of implementing all those recommended recommendations of the Pepper inquiry, and uh, it's not fully it's I, well it's not fully understood or acknowledged that that Jazeera is actually uh, pretty much run by the gas industry. So, but they do do some interesting research, and here's an example. So they did a survey in the Darling Downs in local communities and asked people how their community was reacting to um, gas development in the Darling Downs. So they gave them a number of options, which, we, which I'll read out to you, but they're along the bottom there. And the two bars are just different areas of the Darling Downs that had slightly different results in, in, in feedback. So almost half of the respondents said coal seam gas development, uh, said that as a result of coal seam gas development, their community was either only just coping not coping or resisting. About half of, half of the community said that the community was adapting to the change, which is not a positive endorsement. Like if somebody asks you how you are and you say, oh, well, I'm ad adapting, it's quite different to saying, yeah, doing pretty well, thanks, right? So all of this is either neutral or negative, and only 6% only of people, or around 6% of people, said the community had changed to something better as a result. And I think that's absolutely damning of the social impacts of gas development. And that's a, a survey done by the gas industry. I want to briefly address the, some of the claims that are made uh, on behalf of, the, well, that are made by the, by, uh, the Northern Territory Government uh, on the benefits of the gas industry. So this is from the Northern Territory Government's uh, Beedaloo Basin um, website. So, Two of their headline figures are that it would produce around 13,000 jobs and $17 billion plus of economic activity. When you actually read the uh, economic analysis that underpins that, that was done by Asel Allen for the fracking inquiry, you find that the 13,000 jobs are job years, right? So it's the cumulative amount of jobs over 30, job of years worked over 30 years. So if there's 10 people with a job in fracking, that's, that's not 10 jobs as we'd normal, normally understand it, 10 additional jobs. They present that as 100 jobs, right? Yeah. So, so it's very, it's kind of maybe technically true, but it's just completely misleading. And the second one is the increase in economic activity, uh, $17 billion. That counts the sale the money made from selling all the gas, right? Hardly any of that gets to the Northern Territory. When Tambran uh, charges a Japanese power station for its gas, the Japanese power station are going to send the cheque to Texas, right? And Tambran will send a bit back to the Northern Territory to pay some workers and, um, and, do, and pay for a few other things. So um, it's really misleading to include all of that as a benefit to the Territory. This, this graph just puts it into perspective. So that's your 17, 18 billion dollars that they're talking about in gross state product. A better, a, a, a more accurate analysis is using the increase in net real incomes for people in the Northern Territory. And that would be about two billion dollars which comes to about 80 million dollars a year to the Northern Territory. So it's tiny, you know, I mean it's an exaggeration of, of 10 times. And then in terms of jobs, the actual amount of jobs as distinct from jobs years that the, in the most optimistic case that Asel Allen finds, is 550 additional jobs, uh, not 13,000. But it, it's actually worse than that, because when you read the Asel Allen modelling, they have a few caveats in there. They say, uh, however, total, the total employment impact of the industry development under the Gale scenario, their most optimistic scenario, is minimal due to the resulting draw on labour from other industries in the Territory. Right? So they're saying, well, there, there's some job, but mostly it's, mostly it's offset by job losses elsewhere in the Territory. And Australia-wide, it's net zero. Like, all the jobs, all the additional jobs in the, 
Territory are offset by job losses in the rest of Australia. So the gas industry, according to this economic analysis, is a net zero, in, uh, is a net zero job creator. So how many people does the gas industry employ in the Northern Territory? Um, you know, Impex and Darwin LNG, they're a big deal, right? They're a big thing in the Northern Territory. We're all kind of told that they're, they're a huge deal. So at the moment, in the Northern Territory, they employ about 700 people. Um, plus there's some other jobs in exploration and that kind of thing. So overall, it's about point, uh, it's about 0.7 per cent of the workforce. I've shown it in red there. It's about 1 25th or 1 23rd or something of the jobs provided in health, about 1 20th of the jobs provided in public administration and about 15, you know, 1 15th of the jobs provided in education. Because like everywhere else, the Northern Territory is a modern services-based economy. So it's a, it's a real um, myth that, that, that they're such a huge employer. Now, this is really... This is really important because the reason these projects get approved is largely about jobs, right? So why do you never hear the health industry, the public administration sector, the education sector banging on about how many jobs they provide? The only people that bang on about how many jobs they provide are the oil and gas industry and they're a tiny employer. And they bang on about it to convince people and governments to give them social licence to get these projects approved, because otherwise, why the hell would you want an enormous LNG facility in, in, uh, it, at Middle Arm, in Darwin Harbour? Right? Nobody wants that themselves. They only want it because they think it's going to provide jobs and other economic benefits. So at the Australia Institute, we actually surveyed people to see how effective that is. So we asked people in our, in our polling what their perception of, in terms of um, total employment, how many... What percentage of the workforce does the gas industry employ nationally? And uh, they said on average 10%. It's 0.2%, one fifth of 1%. Right? So they're enormously effective in banging on about jobs. Um, the other thing about jobs to bear in mind is that they're very jobs unintensive. Right? So for every million dollars in output, in sales output, uh, the oil and gas industry produces about 0.4 jobs compared to the education, accom accommodation, administrative services, healthcare, etc., which all provide over eight jobs. Right. So, if you want to, if the government wants to support industries that will provide jobs, if if jobs is the outcome that governments are after, they would support any industry other than the oil and gas industry. So this is how much tax is being paid by the onshore gas companies operating in Queensland since they start, since data was available in 2014 to the most recent data in um, financial year 2020-21. Um, lots of zeros there. In fact, pretty much entirely zeros. That's, that's company income tax. And they've made tens of billions of dollars um, in, in revenue. Uh, um, probably annually, actually. So gas, fracked gas will, is, will be onshore in the Northern Territory, and so they will pay some royalties. So Asel Allen, that modelling I was talking about before, actually uh, estimated how much royalties they would pay. And in their most optimistic scenario, the Gale scenario, they, they said that would be about 60, $69 million a year. So that's about... I think that's about, uh, well anyway, I think that's about uh, half a percent or so something like that. It's a, very, it's a very small amount compared to the total um, $80 billion Northern Territory annual budget. So the argument that we need this to finance our health sector, our education sector, all of that kind of thing is nonsense because the amount of money that will be raised is kind of noise in the scheme of things. That's according to, you know, based industry modelling. Now, the last thing I'm going to talk about is just this idea that we need uh, gas for the East Coast um, because, you know, there's all, they're always banging on about an East Coast gas shortage. So here's, here's East Coast gas use. All the yellow stuff is exported. 
this is um, gas powered generation, industrial use and residential use in, in, um, in, in, on the East Coast. They're all falling, right? So it's pretty much all for export. So that's the first thing to understand. This is, this is zooming in on that. That's, that's it, gas demand is basically falling in all sectors. It's kind of flatlining in industrial a bit, but it, it, uh, in households, I should say, but expected to fall over time, right? So gas demand is falling. So the vast bulk of the gas is being exported. Um, gas demand on the East Coast is falling. And, the, and if you... If you did, if Northern Territory gas did make its way to the east coast, what it means is that the gas companies exporting gas on the east coast can just export gas from gas fields that have tradition that were developed to supply the east coast and currently supply the east coast, mostly from the Cooper Basin, right? So it's a shell game. They bring in some gas from some. They always use the argument that they have to drill for more gas to provide to bring down gas prices and secure supply on the east coast but it's a shell game because as soon as they drill for more gas and bring more gas in they just export more gas from some they export other the equivalent amount from somewhere else right so it's a, it's a great big shell game and if they did really need gas here's where they'd find it this is all the blue is the gas used in the different sectors in um, the domestic economy and the red is exported gas. The second biggest gas use after gas that's exported is gas used by the LNG companies to run their LNG terminals to prepare gas for export. I suggest that if there's a gas shortage on the East Coast, which will only ever be tiny, by the way, if it, you know, on an annual basis, that's where they should look rather than fracking the territory. Thanks for watching. If you like watching our videos or if you learn something new, let us know by leaving a like. And if you share this video on your social media or send it to a friend, that really helps us to get the message out. See you next time.